Um, right. So uh, we're going to keep uh, introductions uh, brief since everybody here knows everyone. Our first speaker um, is uh, Tom Bever, who's going to tell us uh, some things about some uh, cognitive science things to carry us for it. And Brian asked me to remind you repeatedly, if you have not already seen Chris uh, or sent me your slides, or if you're back there still tinkering and you've changed, uh, please make sure you get in touch uh, with Chris or me. Uh, and uh, we're going to keep things uh, informal and uh, fun and uh, just uh, try to remember how uh, uh, great Jerry was. And Tom's going to get us going. Um, uh, first talk, Tom. Thanks. Well, hello. Uh, this is uh, bittersweet in certain ways. Definitely a uh, memory. I'm going to indulge with a few extra remarks simply about uh, how I met Jerry uh, and how we started working together. Um, that car played a critical role in my uh, intellectual development. I first uh, became acquainted with the car in my second graduate year. Uh, I was both a linguistics graduate student and an aspiring psychology graduate student at the same time. Jerry was a fresh postdoc at MIT. I'm not sure actually in what department, because every department tried to claim him already. Um, and Jerry lived a little farther out from MIT than I did, and he kindly, spontaneously offered to ferry me in and out of MIT, uh, because I didn't have an extra car to do that. And so uh, many wintry days, were spent with frozen hands <laughs> trying to clear off the windshield of a car that was never meant to deal with Boston winters. But what it did do was to stimulate early discussions. Uh, I came <coughs> with a strong interest in the biological analogs to language, uh, and Jerry came with fresh ideas about uh, philosophy of mind already, and language in particular, semantics in particular. He was working with Jerry Katz at that time. And in these rather haphazard conversations, uh, we decided that maybe something could be done empirically uh, to put a few, a little meat on this new way of thinking about language, generative grammar. And uh, Luke Teuber, who had started a new Department of Psychology, it was really an early Department of Cognitive Neuroscience, or Neuroscience, actually. Uh, he was very anxious to have bridges to uh, the other part of MIT, uh, where Noam Chomsky was, and Mars Halley, and so on. And so he gave Jerry and me an enormous room, uh, about maybe a third the size of this room, well, maybe not that big, I don't know, but big. Uh, and a small budget, and we started doing experiments together. Um, and that's how uh, some of this got started. Uh, I'm not going to take time to um, tell you what I'm going to say. I'm just going to say it. So the first question uh, is that, that these are all questions that preoccupy Jerry, and sometimes Jerry and me, and then later more me than Jerry as he moved away from direct experimental work into other kinds of interests. But an enduring question uh, was and is, how do we pair up a grammar with actual behavior? And uh, George Miller had given an early uh, exciting answer, uh, which was uh, encapsulated, if this will work, uh, in the language cube down here. Uh, showing the so-called psychological reality of transformations uh, between negative, passive, passive, negative, negative, passive, question, question, negative, question. Uh, showing that uh, uh, 
behaviorally, uh, you could demonstrate that uh, this <clears throat> way of representing the relation between constructions had some empirical support. Uh, and a number of Georgia students who went on also to very important careers, uh, like Jack Naylor and uh, Harris Salmon and others, uh, were part of this army uh, demonstrating one way or another that the language cube accounted for this kind of behavior or that kind of behavior or this other kind of behavior. Uh, and it really looked quite exciting uh, that uh, there could be a um, direct relationship between uh, what a grammarian comes up with fooling around on a blackboard uh, and um, what could lead to experimental work and then come back again in such a way that the experimental work could inform the uh, theoretical work. Uh, and uh, so there was a big excitement. Uh, I recall George gave uh, a lecture, a special lecture, uh, at Harvard. Um, and we all trooped over from MIT uh, to hear this uh, exciting uh, way of uh, thinking an early manifestation of some ways of doing cognitive science, so it wasn't called that then, uh, and uh, really uh, dominated thinking. But it didn't work. Uh, and it wasn't just Jerry who, who discovered that or pointed it out, but Jerry was one of the uh, clearer and more vocal uh, critics of, of that based on empirical failures of uh, the ability to predict uh, how complex a sentence would be as a function of the number or arrangement of transformations involved in it. Um, so um, I joined in that uh, uh, in a slightly oblique way, trying to make sense out of why uh, it wasn't really working out. Not just that uh, the relationship between the grammar and behavior is, as Jerry and Merrill put it, abstract, but what is that relation? Is there a relation? Uh, and uh, my first idea, I don't know, second, third, nth idea, I don't know, but an, an idea, not unique to me, uh, was that something important about uh, statistical generalizations plays an important role in the actual actualities of language behavior. Uh, this may seem like an obvious uh, point at this point, but at the time, given where we were starting from, which was the purity and the way of generative syntax, uh, this was a troublesome idea, and I got a lot of gas from my linguistics professors, former professors, over that very idea. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, in a way, the idea was to at least save off in a theoretical corner somewhere uh, the abstract grammar and the messy stuff would be, that, that seemed to invalidate the grammar, uh, would be uh, uh, swept under the rug of performance ideas, performance models. So, the question was how to build on that. And the difficulty was, and is, for people interested in language behavior and interested in trying to integrate behavior with uh, ongoing theoretical models of language, is that grammars, at least for the last 60 years, have been a moving target, even within the framework of generative syntax, never mind other approaches. So there was syntactic structures, but the idea was that Roughly every six or seven years, maybe five to seven years, Gnome would go up to a mountain <laughs> and he would come down with new tablets <laughs> that, that were the truth in the way, and he would leave behind a lot of idle worshippers uh, who, had, who had really used up a lot of their neurons learning the, the truth in the way that had been the truth in the way from the previous visit to the mountain. Uh, so, uh, there was syntactic structures and then aspects of the theory of syntax, kind of similar but importantly changed, so-called surface interpretivism, 
which was understandable at any rate as a knee-jerk response to generative semantics. Uh, and then uh, so-called government binding, which was really like taking a hammer to the, the theory and splitting it up into a whole bunch of different things called theories, uh, like case theory and so on. Uh, well, the problem for a psychologist or somebody interested in the behavior side of things, uh, the um, problem is that it takes a couple of years to think of an experiment and another year to design it and another year to run it, and then God knows how long to get it published. <laughs> Uh, and by that time, linguists are looking at you uh, down their conceptual noses and just saying, well, that grammar isn't operative anymore. <laughs> uh, that's from the Nixon White House, in case you don't understand the use of the word operative. Uh, so um, we are today enjoying a so-called minimalist model. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about it, and as you'll see, I'm thinking about ways that we can actually benefit from it. Uh, but the first question is, how would we implement it? What it would it mean to implement it, sort of relatively speaking, relatively directly, as was the attempt with the derivational theory of complexity? So here is, um, oh wait, well, never mind about Yahoo's beware, that's another topic, uh, except uh, that many people have leapt into the bat of performance uh, and left structure of language far, far behind. But that's another story. So here is a demonstration by Monsei Sands, a professor now in Japan, former student, um, uh, showing graphically and auditorily uh, what phrase building is like in uh, a, a minimalist model. So she gives each type of uh, operation a noise just so we can follow it. And there are, these are the diff different uh, operations that um, under one and a relatively earlier version of minimalism uh, compose phrases, which is what uh, phrase building is about. Uh, so there are various things that have to be done to build a phrase to make sure you got it right. Uh, and uh, so on. So here is a demonstration of uh, the boy arrived. Um, first, we have an enumeration at that time. That was a way of uh, simply specifying what the lexical items were going to be or were. And here we go. sentences in that domain um, are represented, but they're represented as unordered, as a hierarchical structure, uh, but not uh, with linear order. Um, and that what imposes, what creates all this stuff uh, that differentiates one language from another uh, and uh, creates a lot of uh, serial constraints is the need to squeeze the hierarchy uh, into a serial string. Um, and uh, in the case of auditory language, of course, that's extreme. We can see that there's variability in this process when we look at languages that aren't quite as constrained with respect to serial uh, limitations, and American Sign Language and other sign languages is an example of that, where certain kinds of things can be done in parallel, 
uh, and uh, you can set up actually what is something like a hierarchical structure, a discourse structure, uh, and then uh, indicate different things happening by simply pointing to different places in the discourse structure that you have set up. And that's a way of dem that's an existence demonstration that uh, when uh, the seriality constraint is weaker than other kinds of more <coughs> excuse me, hierarchically organized representations can come into play. So the question is, what can we study uh, within this general framework? Um, and um, the first thing that we think of, well, first thing I think of, uh, when thinking about Jerry and historical issues, uh, is uh, the use of the so-called uh, click paradigm, mislocation of clicks being, as it were, attracted by uh, major phrase boundaries. So I don't know if this is going to work. We'll have to see. Hang on. It's supposed to be a auditory. Not quite all of the brand new chairs were shipped that day. That little tone is otherwise known as a click. Uh, clicks are kind of hard to record tones are a little easier. So these are the kinds of things that subjects would hear. The inexperienced pilot lost his breath since the plane dove too fast. And uh, the first ideas, and many of the ideas that followed, were that something about uh, the surface organization into phrases was actually met metaphorically attracting the clicks, that the, these uh, brief interruptions were being repelled to the boundaries of natural units. And there are visual analogs to that process uh, that show that there's an integrity of a, of a visual figure that uh, can actually also uh, push around interruptions of extraneous material to outside the figure. <coughs> and other demonstrations since then, that this is not a, a phenomenon unique to language. Uh, and, and there was, of course, very old research actually going back to Wundt uh, which uh, capitalizes on the same general uh, conceptual way of thinking. Uh, so this, this would be a, if this was a click location, the double crosshatch would indicate where the favorite uh, response position is, uh, same here. Uh, and um, I won't go through all of the different steps demonstrating that it wasn't an effective intonation and it wasn't effective statistical predatory stability and a whole bunch of other things uh, that had to be tracked down uh, that made a number of careers just tracking them down, mine included for a while. Um, but the denouement was a major question, which was whether the whole thing was a response bias. Uh, and this is a summary of a study that we did uh, uh, in which there actually were click cases of presentation where there was no tone present or no click but there were boundaries given to the subject indicating where it could have been. Uh, and sometimes there was a click within those boundaries. And the question is to look at the differential response between when there is a click and then where there isn't. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, demonstrating that that arguably is a perceptual effect. There is a response bias. The response bias is to imagine uh, that a click came earlier in this window, the click that wasn't there, uh, than uh, the center of that window. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a guessing bias, and it's reflected in also empirically when there is a click present or a tone, that there's a preposition. And that's, that leads to a whole story about why, in general, these interruptions are preposed, characteristically not postposed. Uh, when the option uh, would be equally available with respect to the syntactic break. It's again an interesting story, but a different story. Uh, we'll come back to briefly. Uh, there was in these uh, studies an early hint that something about the internal phrase organization, not just the surface organization, was at issue here. Uh, and this was contrasting sentences that arguably at the time had the same surface structure, but different so-called deep structures. So the general desired the troops to fight. If the general desired the troops to fight, the general did not desire the troops, uh, as opposed to the general defied the troops to fight, in which case 
the general did divide the troops. So it's a different thematic organization than what is superficially the same sort of surface sequence. And what we found is that indeed the inner form, uh, to use a classic way of referring to deep structure, uh, was operative in uh, determining or at least influencing where these interruptions were mis misheard. And we can actually look backwards now and we could reinterpret that uh, as arguing not something about deep structure because deep structure has uh, been replaced uh, from Mount Ararat, as I mentioned, uh, now with a notion of uh, uh, what's called a phase, which is basically a set, I'm tempted to call it a sequence, but it's a set uh, that uh, is, uh, has enough thematic information in it uh, to uh, merit being handed off to semantic representation. That's a, a technical issue. Um, so, uh, what can we do to study uh, the formation of phases? Um, quick mislocation is a kind of fuzzy way of doing this, uh, to say the least, and it has a lot of stuff built in, and suppositions built into it that may not be consistent uh, with some aspects of the theory. And so the question is, can we think of other ways of probing early stages of phase uh, formation? Uh, and um, I thought about a technique that Dave Townsend and I uh, used to study aspects of discourse processing versus sentence processing, uh, not originally devoted to this, but instead of using a click uh, or a tone, uh, we actually changed the voice, uh, and with just an, with one syllable. And the reason to be interested or try that is that uh, you can, and, and subjects sometimes reported that the way they were dealing with tone location was they were mentally putting the sentence over here somewhere, and then there was the tone over here, and they were separating them, uh, and then putting it back together because that's what we asked them to do, uh, which is what motivated in part the necessity of checking out whether there was a serious uh, response bias that was controlling the systematic mislocation. Uh, but when you actually change a voice uh, uh, with one syllable, you can't really get away from it because it's giving you intrinsically some of the information in the speech signal. Uh, and that seemed to be preferable for certain certain ways. Let's see if this will play. Here we are. The prisoner is demanded by the agent to try to escape. See if I can make that a little louder. I think that's as loud as it gets. Hmm. Well, let's try this one. The actress recognized by the writer left in a hurry. Okay, so this is what it sounds like. And uh, it, what's interesting is that part of comprehension involves comp computing, at least in principle, a theory of the vocal tract of the speaker. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot to this. An issue that comes into play when you substitute a syllable uh, within uh, a stream of, of a sentence spoken by one speaker, you substitute it with a different speaker. And we tried to pick a male, this isn't not the examples that we used. In the actual research, uh, we had a male with a relatively high voice, as far as the pitch is concerned, and a female with a relatively low voice relative to females, uh, so that the, the, uh, the pitch level was roughly the same, but the configuration of the vocal tract was different. Uh, and so there's a, a, an, it intrinsically calls on a hierarchically organized set of computations. So this is just a chart of the data, which I won't bore you with, uh, uh, from the study that I did with Dave Townsend. And the, um, there are certain properties. There were actually a lot of mislocations. Um, and uh, the, as with the clicks or tones, there was a preposing effect. The, the, the voice change that people thought they heard tended to migrate somewhere earlier uh, in the sentence than where it actually occurred. But most importantly, exceptions to this uh, involve movements from 
uh, position within a phase or a phrase, depending on how you think about it, uh, uh, to the head of that uh, phase or phrase. Uh, and so uh, this raises a very interesting question, whether it's an early stage in comprehension, in processing, is to construct some kind of module, model representation of the phrase, of the phase with a head, and then with uh, modifiers attached to it, that infects the acoustic organization, uh, which I think is a, is a frontier uh, in uh, the study of language that we're just beginning to sense we, we have to pay attention to. For a long time, the idea was, well, there's the acoustics, and then it gets turned into a mental representation, whatever that means. We assumed it meant not acoustic, uh, and uh, then we could study that. I think that there's emerging evidence, uh, in particular some really interesting studies by Andrea Morrow uh, and others suggesting that, in fact, within the inner workings of it, whether it's externalization or something else, uh, uh, neurologically, there actually uh, is a blend of the acoustics and the, uh, we would call it the syntactic representation. That's just, I don't have much more to say about that, that except I think that's where things are heading. So, uh, with respect to this particular technique, the question is, it's, a, it's in a sense, acoustic binding or misbinding, uh, often used in the study of vision, a part of the corresponding type of phenomenon, uh, where a feature migrates to somewhere where it wasn't supposed to be, or it wasn't, we thought it wasn't supposed to be. And whether we can use this as a technique uh, to probe early stages of um, phase building. Well, maybe. Uh, the study with Dave Townsend was not designed specifically to study that. This is post hoc analysis. Uh, and so the next step is to design some materials and studies that really probe that uh, issue in particular. Okay. Next topic explored at great length by Jerry. Jerry argued that the poverty of the stimulus that the child has to deal with uh, in learning language, but then more generally, is what makes cognitive science uh, necessary, or if you look at it a different way, possible, uh, depending on your point of view. Would there be a cognitive science if there wasn't poverty in the stimulus, uh, is another way of putting it. Because, in particular, it's what really puzzles us. So, uh, if you look at the syntax of sentences, uh, there are many issues where, conceptually speaking, something later, something downstream, depends on something upstream or that came earlier. That's many phenomena, co-reference and other kinds of things. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is the extremes to, that this goes to in normal uh, language processing, not careful uh, laboratory ease uh, that we all study uh, just to make sure that all the words are really clearly announced and pronounced and so on and so on. None of which is true in normal talking. None of which is true in when, a, when somebody is giving a, a scientific so-called uh, discourse such as what I'm doing right now. Tremendous numbers of syllables, words, whole phrases are mangled uh, compressed, in some cases not even there, in some sense of there. Cues are there somewhere else to what is missing here, uh, in the way I'm talking right now. And I'm hoping that more or less you are following what I'm saying, and more or less you are imagining that I'm actually articulating everything really perfectly. Uh, because that's what you are reconstructing for me. Uh, but it's not really there, and I'll show you this. So this has many uh, implications for the uh, issues about consciousness that I'll briefly mention in general. Uh, but in particular, what it does to the poverty of the stimulus is it really, really tells us that it's a much bigger problem than has usually been discussed. No one usually discusses it in terms of the child's difficulty in figuring out how to ask questions with respect to the statement, uh, let's say, uh, birds that... Birds that fly swim, 
which gets the question being, can birds that fly swim, not can something else that I can't even say, <laughs> <laughs> because I only know how to say it correctly, more or less. But the point is that the assumption that is made when Noam and others talk about the poverty of the stimulus and the puzzle it presents for the child, which of course now we realize is all about externalization, uh, is um, uh, the words are there. The idea is the kid is handed the words, like on a teletype or a telegram or something, uh, uh, and uh, then the, the kid's problem is to figure out order constraints or other kinds of constraints on how the words are put together. Well, the fact is the words aren't there. And I'll show you that is true even of what we call motherese or used to call motherese. Ertakeries? I have no idea what we call them now. Something, something ease. What kids hear ease. Uh, so here's some examples. This is from normal conversation between two adults, courtesy of my colleague um, uh, Natasha Warner, and I have totally lost track of time. Can somebody tell me where I am? I don't even know, know when I started. Say it again. Well, well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. So anyway, here's an example. Uh, if it works. Listen to this. This is a snippet of a conversation between two friends. I'll tell you that this is actually, if you argue what it's representing, it's four syllables and actually arguably, arguably four words. I'll play it again. Okay, here's the actual conversational sequence. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, I'll put it here so you can see what's going on. It's going to have to. What you hear is going to have to. What's there is this. Got to. Uh, and, uh, but what you hear, what you reconstruct. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Uh, so it's a very, very powerful phenomenon. Um, now, that was where, arguably, there was preceding context. Here's a case where there's following context, which I think is most important. Your turn. Your turn. Sorry, yeah, PowerPoint is clipping in. Your turn. Okay, here's the larger sequence that it comes from. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? So it's really, do you have time? This little clip uh, gets reconstructed as, do you have time? Um, so um, I think I'll skip over this in the interests of time itself, uh, except to point out that uh, uh, here, just get, let me give you this little bit. Turn it. Turn it. Turn it. Okay, here I'm just going to give you the following context. Turn and spot it. Turn and spot it. Turn and spot it. You get it? No? Nobody gets it? Somebody got it. <laughs> it's chilling in them. It's chilling in them. As in chilling in the spot. Uh, I've tested this. Let's put this here. Oh, uh, we're trying uh, Oh, full. Well, here's the full context. Uh, or uh, Tuesday night, uh, we're trying to. Oh, didn't give it. Well, sorry. Uh, at any rate, uh, the point is that uh, <coughs> that we can study is whether it's preceding context that's at issue, following context that's at issue. What's the structure of the following context? Can we test the hypothesis? Uh, but, uh, so, uh, come on. Uh, there we are. Uh, and finally, we can test whether it's a phase, whether it's a phrase, whether it's some other kind of structure, whether it's statistically uh, mediated. Okay, here's. They ripple. They ripple. They ripple. This is actual motherese or caretakerese spoken. Well, it's a mother, obviously. Uh, to uh, a child, a mother that I'm glad I didn't have. And here's the reason, oops, here's the reason I'm glad I didn't have her as a mother. Well, great, let me move those magazines so you can get on the ripple. So 
mommy moved those magazines so you couldn't get them and rip them. This is a great mommy, right? <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, we're making the point that this is uh, shows that the real problem, sorry, the real poverty of the stimulus uh, is a much bigger magical phenomenon. I mean, it can't be magic, but it's a bigger mystery with respect to how the child deals with it. Never mind how I don't deal with it. Uh, there's a bonus problem when studying this, uh, which I don't have time to discuss in detail, but actually preoccupies a lot of my current research, which is using our conscious reconstruction of stuff that isn't there and post-reconstruction, reconstruction based on something that came, I guess from your standpoint, later, I don't know which way, uh, uh, as a way of probing certain aspects of consciousness. Because we have the belief, listeners have the belief that they heard, simul that when they heard the acoustics, they simultaneously assigned it aspects of lexical and uh, semantic representation on the spot. And we can show, at least in certain cases, that that can't have happened until later. Uh, and so that creates a very interesting paradigm and mystery, too. Okay, last point. Is there a common representation for language? Whether you think of it as in the externalization system or internal or whatever you think about it. And um, what I'm going to do is briefly uh, show some differences between two major groups of normal people. We're not looking at genetic uh, uh, or uh, some kind of pathological cases uh, or unusual cases, but really very usual cases. Namely, the difference between right-handers with and without familial left-handedness in their background. That's it. And I'll just warn you that as I talk about this, you're going to, you go to sleep occasionally in lectures the way I do, and then you suddenly wake up and try to figure out what the speaker was talking about. You're going to assume, oh, he must be talking about left-handers. No, I'm only talking about right-handers with respect to whether they have familial left-handedness or not. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'll say this a little differently. <laughs> uh, so try to keep this in mind. Um, and I make the additional point that we're not talking about small groups of people. We're talking about two very large, what we have to call normal speakers, nothing special in, in any anomaly sense uh, about their brains. Well, there are behavioral differences that we have been tracking for many years, initially for accidental reasons that are too hilarious for me to explain how we started doing it. Uh, but uh, the, the generalization is that people with familial left-handedness tend to focus their language processing on individual lexical items, relatively speaking, and this is all relative, of course. Whereas people without familial left-handedness tend to focus more on compositional, uh, what we would otherwise traditionally call phrases. And there are various ways of showing this that I don't have time to go through. Uh, but what I will go do is to present an experiment that I know is done right, because I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> I just played a role in designing it and encouraging the people who did it uh, to do it right. That is to say, Angela Federici, uh, and her colleagues in Leipzig. Uh, and what we did was to contrast anomaly detection in language, uh, what happens in the brain, or at least in the skull above the brain, uh, contrast that with what happens with um, the harmonic anomalies in musical sequences. So firstly, the so-called ELAN, which is well known, it's controversial as to what it really means but nobody says it isn't there. Um, and uh, so we have cases like this, if I can play this. Die Trompete wurde geblasen. So the trumpet was uh, blown, and then we contrast that. It should be trumpet, but now the other contrasting thing is trombone. doesn't matter, I hope. Die Posaune wurde zu geblasen. So there's sort of zur, zu der, uh, zur in German, it's at the. So the trombone was at the 
In German, that would be an okay sentence if it, what, if it was followed by the word concert. So the trump under drum, yeah, the trombone was at the concert blown, literally speaking, would be an okay German sentence. But instead of getting the concert, you get blown right away, which is an anomaly. And so you characteristically get uh, a so-called early left anterior negativity. And for those of you who understand the mysteries of EEG representation, negative is up, uh, not down. Uh, so that's more negativity when there's an anomaly. Now, in the case of music, uh, what had been found by Pilch and Daniela Samler and others uh, is a kind of corresponding except an early right anterior negativity when some kind of musical unusual or anomaly occurs. They don't get much more boring than that. Okay, now here's, uh, if I can do it, well... <laughs> well, I've got somebody anyway. <laughs> Okay, it's not really dissonant, it just doesn't belong there. Uh, okay, so um, the Iran has been found in response to that, but in both cases, the, the Elan and the Iran, there's a lot of subject variability. It's almost bimodal in each case. Well, I smell that when visiting Leipzig and decide, well, let's just try to see if this is related to familiar landings, uh, is differentiating the two kinds of subjects. So we designed an experiment uh, in which there were correct sentences. Die Maus wurde gefangen. A little less loud. Incorrect sentences. Der wurde vorm gefangen. So that form is the football was before the, okay, now you could say whistle or wall, depending on what you meant. Um, and then what the subjects thought they were doing was detecting whether there was, in fact, a voice change. Die Torte wurde gebacken. Okay, so uh, they didn't think they were supposed to be worrying about anomalies. And so here's a, a depiction of the LAN, the left end, the, sorry, the AN, the anterior negativity. This, the red dots are for people without familiar left-handedness who show the, the typical left bias. People with familiar left-handedness show no bias one way or the other. Well, you might say, okay, that just shows that they're using the right hemisphere more for everything, and it's sort of more balanced than the left hemisphere. It's not that simple. Uh, so going back to the music. Okay, so we designed a corresponding study uh, that I don't think I'm going to go through it, it, everything. I will. It's probably going to force me to. supposed to detect the change in the instrumentation. Again, the corresponding change in the voice. These are the results. So the people without familiar left handedness show the characteristic dominant pattern of a right anterior negativity. But now the people um, without, sorry, with familiar left handedness, rather than showing even more right hemisphere activity, actually now show more left hemisphere activity. Or above, you know, what we can measure with the EEGs. So, to make the point, it isn't just that people with familiar left-handedness somehow use the right hemisphere more for everything. There's some kind of more general neurological reorganization in this show. Okay, so uh, we constructed a model, and I won't go through how we did it, of uh, the genetic risk of being left-handed. And we can correlate that now as a continuous variable against whether the uh, the AN, the anterior negativity, was more on the left than the right. And this is just a way of showing that the general effect uh, differs as a function of what this shows here, increasing risk now. So now it's not just whether the subject was had left-handers or not, but we're now assessing the risk based on the subject's uh, genetic profile uh, that that subject, although right-handed, remember, they're always right-handed, could have been, would have been, might have been uh, left-handed. And as that risk increases, uh, the uh, 
Uh, we get this picture in the case of language that becomes, in fact, more right hemisphere, but music actually becomes more left hemisphere as far as we're able to measure with EEGs on the skull. Uh, so it's a, there's a real phenomenon here. Uh, I won't spend further time on this, except to go to the final question this all raises, which is, if there is these two large normal groups with different brains to some extent manifesting the self, not the same knowledge of the language, roughly, um, what is that, does that bother us about our idea that language exists and is the way it is because of particular neurological organization? Here we've got normal groups of subjects that arguably have different neurological organizations specifically for language, and yet their manifest linguistic ability is, uh, once you pair away the first couple of milliseconds, uh, experimentally, is basically the same. So what's the cause of the human ability for language? That's the question. Um, well, here we are. Uh, so I will quote Randy. With respect to the issue of whether thinking in terms, and when thinking about mental capacity, from ants all the way up to humans, uh, uh, whether uh, thinking in terms of neurons or neuronal clumps or neuronal groupings or little mini brains or whatever your body or your image is, whether that's adequate. Uh, and I believe Randy has been quoted as saying there has to be something else, uh, that there isn't enough computational power or speed and other factors in, in that way of thinking. And so the question, what, what might it be? Well, here's some listed alternatives uh, that you know, probably are all wrong, but we have to start somewhere. So there are arguments that there's something specific about oscillations, uh, rhythmic changes, uh, rhythmic patterns, uh, in, to, in different registers and the phase relations between them, something inside the neurons, little 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 tiny computers uh, that that live inside the neurons, really tiny, so-called microtubules, that, uh, where tubulin is basically has been thought of as the architectural structure that stops the neuronal wall from collapsing on itself. But there now are arguments that it actually has the capacity, at any rate. Uh, to uh, 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 take on uh, different uh, states, uh, different categorical uh, digital states, and potentially then could be, that could vastly multiply uh, the computational power at issue. And of course, there's always the possibility that, like dark matter, there are dark neurons. Uh, somebody can't prove that that's not true, <laughs> at least not to me. Um, and then there's the whole idea of so-called computational transcendence. That's my term, not, not Randy's term. Uh, but uh, that's a, in, in a way of thinking about what might be an issue. Or something else. We don't really know. Um, but uh, uh, the point is that when you see two major groups of um, people uh, who are sensibly master the language equally well and in the, in the same way, superficially. Um, but we can show that when you really probe hard, they're doing something different behaviorally to some extent, and there are differences in the neurological organization. <coughs> That's just a further way of demonstrating, or at least providing evidence, that there is, it isn't something, strictly speaking, about the neurological organization for language that causes our ability to have language, um, and, or causes it the way, to be the way it is. As Randy says, there has to be something else. So this is what I've said, more or less. Um, and this is why I said it. Uh, as I say here, uh, if half of what I've discussed today is true, <laughs> Uh, it might be strange enough for Jerry. Might not, but it might. So thank you, and thank you, Jerry.
right. So we have some time for questions. Oh, Ooh. all right. It's not going to be a minimalist question. Uh, it's not going to be what? A minimalist question. Oh, let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about the lateralization stuff that you had. I, the reason is that there's an observation of this in Newport a long time ago, which I thought was interesting that I relate to what you were talking about, which had to do with the lateralization question, which is that when you see people who have, say, deficits in their left hemisphere and language so-called migrates to the right. What you observe is it migrates to the same place on the right that it would have been on the left had it been on the left. Yeah. So if something like that is true, the last set of experiments, do they talk so much to different brain, I'll call it overall reorganization, or are they related to Lissa's observation that what we have, so there's an interesting question as to why people lateralize in some ways rather than in others. But is it the case that we're exploiting what we may call entirely different brain regions in the lateralized areas, or is it another is it a version of the observation? Well, um, I think that's sp spoken to to some extent by the fact that in the case of music, it, it turns out to be the opposite for people with familial left-handedness. But it doesn't turn out to be the opposite uh, for people without familiar left hand. So, I say opposite for music, but not for language, is, is what I mean. All right. So, I. Uh, this speaks to the issue of whether brain organization is, in fact, something causing the structure of language to be the way it is, or whether it's the mechanism of externalization. Uh, in which case, reversed um, representation uh, in people who have it, which is it's very rare, actually. That's, that's part of the problem. So people, let, let me go back. You'd think that left-handers, now I'm talking about real left-handers, would characteristically have language representation much more often in the right hemisphere. Uh, but that's not clearly the case. Using uh, the WADA test as a sort of gold standard uh, for uh, where language is represented, uh, almost all left-handers show activation of their language or impairment of it under the WADA test in the left hemisphere. Now, a large proportion of them also show some impairment in the right hemisphere. But the number of left-handers who show impairment only in the right hemisphere is vanishingly close to zero, so close that I'm tempted to think that it's experimental error. Uh, so I don't think we get the kind of reversal, actually, that Lissa was hinting at uh, in, empirically in a clear way. But the question is why is that why are the particular structures in the left hemisphere the structures that emerge? If, if, let's say it's the externalization mechanism, wherever the real I language lives, this is the, these are the mechanisms that get it out. Well, why those? Well, partly you can make an argument that it's geography is destiny. Uh, that won't work as well when you start to think, talk about uh, deaf people. Uh, uh, or certain kinds of computational engines that are indigenous to the our brain and have some localization actually then create uh, the best computational bed for language, whether it's in the left or right hemisphere. If it's in the right hemisphere because of serious damage to the left, for example. Uh, so there is that possibility that there's something computationally unique about the particular areas that are the classic areas uh, for uh, computational language in the brain. Uh, that would be reflected in the same in the right hemisphere, and that the reason it ends up in the left hemisphere follows from some other more general principles that we could argue about separately as to whether it's a general issue or whether it's a specific issue. Uh, yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is about the correlation between the, what we learn from processing the uh, auditory signal and what we learn by, by uh, processing the signal by eye tracking studies. 
to what extent do I the results of the written processing support the word storage processing? I have no idea, uh, really. Well, that's not fair. I have an idea. <laughs> uh, but reading, I've always been doubtful about the utility of reading, studying reading as a way of studying. <laughs> Well, these days, even the utility of it, but that's a different story. Uh, and uh, the, uh, even during the days when the way you got psycholinguistics funded by pretending that you were going to solve the United States' literacy problem, because that was the only way you could get funded. So a lot of research got done on visual processing of the written language, because that's how you could, that's how you could fund studies of what you hoped were the structural variables or statistical variables that you were really interested in. But it was a diversion, in my opinion, because arguably reading is not a natural kind. Uh, it's composite, neurologically. Uh, and language it's isn't. interesting. What? Spoken language isn't. Yeah, well, that's what the composite is. <laughs> you mean the speaking of the language? may be the same as we now, as I'm now in hinting at, yes. Uh, but, uh, and we should simply argue that we shouldn't be studying the speaking of the language either. Uh, <laughs> we should go back and just do linguistics uh, and uh, concentrate on the theory. That's a, that's a coherent point. Um, uh, but I feel that the, the, in the, the, the clear difference is kids pick up the spoken version or whatever the actual language version is. They don't pick up the reading, at least what normally is. All, so all these problems, teaching it and how to teach it and everything else. So there is that difference, whatever that difference really means to us. So I prefer to just look at the spoken language. Uh, eye movements, backtracking, for example, as evidence for uh, post-processing, uh, it is, it, you can probably make a case for that, but I'm, I'm not a, an expert at that literature, and I haven't thought about it that way yet. The other question was about looking at modules, and uh, there's work with genetic, people who have genetic impairment, like with the Fox P2 gene, and I'm wondering about what that says in terms of, uh, in terms of modularity, and if there's been studies about music uh, problems in that population. Are there studies of music? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, I'll let Massimo answer that question uh, about the Fox P2 gene. No, Fox P2 is you know, what's called the language gene, you know, which is the language gene. And it has to do you know, with attention to sequences. So, yes, but, you know, it's, a, it's a more general. So would these people also come with possible music for this one? Yes? I just want to share some information. Uh, Lisa Newport has been studying, I think, about eight-year-olds who are born with only one hemisphere. Yeah. Right. And she claims with absolutely no difference individuals and normal individuals. Uh, there are older studies that build up to that, looking at, looking at hemispherectomies that uh, are performed exactly. when there are particular so, syndromes at birth. Uh, do you, do you, I, I haven't studied everything Alyssa has done recently. The usual, so, I, I'm not up to date in some aspects of that. The usual claim has been that while language seems okay, then there are certain deficits in other areas of, of cognitive capacity, uh, and which may not be true when you're born that way, as opposed to when it, it happened because the hemisphere was removed. It is a puzzle, <coughs> right? I mean, it does say, yeah. there's something about the brain that the language here works. Well, I think Norbert's point, if I can extend it on his behalf, is 
The question is, at any rate, whether it has the same internal organization within the hemisphere. So it's the same relative areas that we would otherwise call Brokos and Pernikos and so on, and pathways uh, that connect them, or whether it's, it's some other scrambling. Uh, if, it was, if it's the same, then the readout of my argument is, well, if that's the, if that's the best that we can do with externalization of I language wherever it exists. Uh, I'm sorry? I don't think she expected it. all her other theory. Alyssa didn't expect it. Is that what you mean? Is that what you were saying, that Alyssa didn't expect it, or who didn't expect it? Yeah, she's saying Alyssa. Yeah. Well, that surprises me. <laughs> Alyssa usually isn't surprised. <laughs> Randy. Somebody in the same vein, so. Of course, the two hemispheres are symmetrical, right? Uh, but uh, some people are born congenitally without a cerebellum. Cerebellum has more than 80% of all the neurons in the brain. Uh, and these people get on fine. Right. And here, of course, you're missing the whole, you're not missing half of something where you've got a complementary replication, you're missing the entire cerebellum. Which is more than eighty percent of all the neurons in the brain, and and people, <laughs> if these people grow to adulthood and they're holy, some some of them have been discovered when they're in their twenties, uh, when they were when they did imaging studies of, uh, China. and so on. And, the woman in China, yeah, and uh, they've been getting on fine. Okay, I'm glad you heard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it does sound strange enough for Jerry. Um, it's, uh, some of what you're talking about sounds like the kinds of things he might say for where concerns would come up for sort of cognition in general, but he would have thought that, that language is the sort of computationally easier case. And what I'm kind of curious, what I'm curious about is one of your last remarks is that there may be a solution here which is it's computationally transcendent. You have to talk. You have to talk with Randy about that. That's that's, that's my terminology, not his. Uh, but he has his own way of talking about it, which I think uh, I won't. I won't try to do for him. Okay, it sounded like the, the idea that you wanted to. Endorse. Right, but you think this is too strange for Jerry? <laughs> I think it's strange enough for Jerry, but I thought he would have taken that strangeness and put it in another area of the mind, not for language. Oh. Well, I look where my personal flashlight points. <laughs> and so there are other areas of cognition in the brain that are dark to me, but not necessarily to others. So you could be right that that would be a better way of thinking about it or exploring it. Yep. Um, so in the language of thought, when Jerry was talking about what the kid is doing on hearing speech. He's, he talked there and then, and then for a while said, well, the kid's really just trying to do is figure out what the person is saying. So he seemed to have this picture that, you know, you have a language faculty, maybe dealt with some phonology and some syntax, but then you cut to some independent language of thought, um, which had its own characteristics. So I just wondering if you could say uh, a little bit about how that either complicates um, the study of um, you know, some pretty even some of the click experiments you were talking about before, and say, say a little bit about where you would or wouldn't have wanted to agree with him about that. I would never disagree with that when Jerry took his face. <laughs> Life, is too short. <laughs> Life is too short. Uh, <laughs> and also, I have so much respect for Jerry, I didn't want to waste his time. Um, but and, and I, I, that's my way of not answering your question, because I don't think I fully understand your question. Can you try again? Yeah. So um, when he was discussing um, some of these issues towards the end of the language of thought, and then throughout um, uh, when these issues came up, he certainly made it sound like he was thinking the child, they get this, there's something going on out there, 
And now what they're trying to do is cut through a representation of what the speaker said. Not, not a representation of the syntactic structure uh, or not a representation of what semanticists would not be a meaning of the sentence. No, you were going right for what were they trying to get across to me? And that was a representation in your language of thought of some sentence that they had in their language of thought that they got pronounced in some way already or other. But like who who really went to worry about all that? Middleman and stuff, right? And, and, I just, and that, if, if that anything looks like that, the right, of course, it complicates what conclusions we draw from claims about parsing and click studies. Well, not necessarily. I mean, if, if what's important to the child, and one of the reasons I think that we don't pay enough attention to ordinary language that surrounds the child when we think about the poverty of the stimulus, uh, too much attention, I think, even today, is given. The so called mother ease or caretaker ease, in which this giant face looms over the child <laughs> and says in very clear English with totally exaggerated intonation some inane question like whether the child would like a cookie or not. <laughs> uh, I think that's pretty uninteresting and possibly, possibly obnoxious from the standpoint of the child, but maybe I'm projecting. Uh, <laughs> but, but my point is, what the child wants to know, listening to the adults talk, and things like, are they, are they going to have a fight? Am I going to have to go to bed early? <laughs> When's supper? Uh, and things like that. I mean, so if the child is trying to extract, whether that's in the language, whether that's in mental ease or not, whatever, whatever it's in, the child is really trying to extract the meaning in that sense of meaning, of the discourse around it. And then maybe, except in these kinds of uh, situations to some extent, uh, that's what we do most of the time. You know, like, this person I'm sitting next to is going to bite me? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting next to an airplane? Uh, uh, or is this person you know, going to snore? I mean, whatever it is. Uh, maybe those are things I'm trying to figure out from the discourse. But whether you can do that, Without all of the computation that starts, see, I, I always follow Lala's direction. When I was first saying this, when I said about a clause ago, she was going like this, and I thought, uh oh, <laughs> that means I better get the syntax in there. <laughs> so I did. Uh, <laughs> the point is, how can you get to the question? Of what the person really means, or what this really means from the standpoint of our social interaction, from what the person says, never mind how the person looks and various other pieces of evidence. But if you're trying to get it all from what the person says, how do you do it without having an analysis of what the person said? Uh, it, it does seem to me like a, otherwise it's magic of some sort. Uh, and that, I think, <coughs> would be too strange for Jerry. Um, um, this is just a request for you to repeat something because I bogged out a little bit. When you were talking about externalization, I thought I knew what you were talking about, but then when you appealed to it later as a uh, possible uh, uh, explanation for some of the, uh, the data that you were presenting, I realized I didn't really know what externalization was. So I wondered if you could just repeat that. Well, what it refers to is the idea that the internal language that organizes things into something like sentences, but that is not, for example, serially organized, except insofar as phases, if that's the unit of organization, of course, have boundaries. And so something in this phase has to be, some, in some sense, not serially ordered, but separate, at any rate, from something in this phase. Um, uh, if that's the internal representation that is given to sentences, then the problem is how to squeeze that into serial behavior. And that's the externalization mechanism that is conceptualized. And part of the point I was emphasizing is that we don't have to think of that just in terms of some set of rules or algorithms or something. We can also ask the question whether the mechanisms that we think are causally related to language behavior, such as Broca's area and so on and so on, 
and the connections between them, uh, whether they just happen to be the uh, computationally most felicitous neurological mechanisms to carry out the externalization, uh, or whether there is something uniquely causal about it. Now, Randy's point, for example, about getting by without massive areas of the brain, or what Rochelle brought up with respect to what Lisa is showing, and so on. I mean, that all makes us think. I mean, it, it's not, I guess nothing by itself is definitive, but it makes us think about the, the possibility that <coughs> the mechanisms that we have loved so much since the mid uh, uh, 19th century uh, really are happenstance in this sense of happenstance, not directly causally uh, related to certainly the inner organization of language. That, that's the idea. It's not my idea. I mean, this is, uh, well, maybe some of what I said is my ideas. But it's the wrong parts that are to, to my ideas. <laughs> Just a quick follow up. So it used to be back when I could understand linguistics um, that the difference between English and German would be a matter of different parameter settings. And that would be part of the grammar. But it sounds like externalization should be something universal or. How do, uh, well, the mechanisms, presumably, well, you don't even know about that. I mean, think, look at the, the special brains, the brains that are yeah. broken in special ways. Or brains that differ, which is what the case study I, I gave uh, is about. And it's not clear to me how much of the difference between German and English is really a difference in the language. No one has argued they're the same language. Uh, they're just dialect differences. Uh, from the standpoint of the proverbial Martian. Uh, but that the serialization, right? Yeah, I mean, that, right. That that's not internal. The, the thought is that's not internal to language processing. That's state some state other state. source of constraint. I sneaked. <laughs> <laughs> Miraculously, we are actually not behind yet. So let's um, thank Tom. Uh,